The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents Son of Mine, starring Ward Bond and Richard Lyon. Eddie Cantor is your host. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Now, your family theater host for tonight, Eddie Cantor. This is a very busy world in which we live. Whether you're in Hollywood or New York, it's just the same. You find people rushing around here and there, back and forth. You call up a friend to say hello. Before you get halfway through telling him your troubles, he says, but I'm too busy to talk now. Your friends are too busy to call. Your relatives too busy to write. Everybody's too busy. Yes, sometimes too busy to do a lot of things like being kind and thoughtful. Too busy to be smiling and cheerful or lend a helping hand to those who need it. And many homes are unhappy because parents haven't time for their children, haven't time to get together as a family. Why? Well, they're too busy, that's all. We need a little more time out, folks. Yes, all of us, especially at home. We'd have a lot more happier homes if people took more time out for home life together, more time out for family prayer. Yes, that's important. Because if we're too busy to think of God, too busy to find time for family prayer, then we're really too busy. We'll hear from Eddie Cantor again later in the program. Now, Family Theater presents Son of Mine, starring Ward Barn, Richard Lyon, with Dan O'Hurley. <laughs> My name is Mark Bronson. Beth, she's my wife. Well, we'd been married three years before Randy, our only child, was born. Having him meant an awful lot to us. Maybe we've spoiled him a little. I'm not sure. Well, Randy's 12 now. This year, we sent him up to Cloverdale School. That took a lot of juggling of the budget and cutting corners here and there, but it was worth it. Cloverdale is a fine school. Randy's meeting a lot of nice kids there, sons of important families, kids with background. Everything was fine until last week. Last week, a letter came from Headmaster Elliot inviting me to attend the annual Father and Son Day. That's a traditional affair at the school. It was something I hadn't counted on. Beth thought I was crazy when I told her I wasn't going. Nonsense, darling. Of course you're going. Randy'd never forgive you if you stayed away. Now, wait a minute, Beth. You, you don't get what I'm driving at. I don't want to embarrass the boy. Embarrass him? Beth, listen. The kids that go to Cloverdale are sons of big men, men high up in the business world. How do you think Randy's going to feel when he has to explain that his father is only a drugstore manager? Oh, Mark, that's ridiculous. Besides, Randy will be expecting you. All the other fathers will be there, and then you'll be with Randy when he comes home for the Thanksgiving holidays. But, Beth, don't you understand how much it means to a man to have his son look up to him with respect? Why, up there, I'll be out of place. Randy will be proud to have you there. Prouder, probably, than most of his friends are, are of their fathers. That's a nice sentiment, darling. Well, kids are funny. I, I don't want to run the risk of losing Randy's respect. There'll be big businessmen and bankers and... Well, I'm only a small-town pharmacist. Oh, what has that to do with it, dear? Don't you know that to Randy, you're the most important person in the world? Well, around a small town like this, he thinks I'm somebody, but... You want uh, him to continue to think so. Of course you do. Then go up to Cloverdale and act just the way you've always acted. That's what Randy will expect. That's what will make him the proudest boy in the school. Beth won out. She usually does. And usually, she seems to know what's right and what's best. Sending Randy to Cloverdale was her idea. I had to admit it was a good one. But going up to Cloverdale for a father and son day 
Well, I felt that was out of my style. Anyway, we wired Randy that I'd be there. We dug into our savings and bought a new suit for me. Beth got out the tie Randy had given me last Christmas and packed my bag. We were up early on the big day and drove to the station in our old car. Well, how do I look, Beth? Like a big banker? Oh, you look wonderful, darling. Randy will be proud of you. I wish I could be sure. You know, Beth, this is the first time I really wanted to be something more important than a drugstore manager in a little town like Lakeville. Oh, darling, you are important. To Randy and me, you're the most important person in the world. Don't you ever forget that. Beth. Yes, darling? Did I ever tell you that I'm the luckiest man in the world? The luckiest? Yeah. To have you for a wife. <laughs> I married a pretty nice guy myself. Oh. oh, go on, dear. You'll miss the train. Okay, goodbye, Beth. <laughs> oh, goodbye. Have a good time, darling. Kiss Randy for me. Goodbye. Bye, Mark. Good luck now. <laughs> When I was alone, my doubts returned. I knew I was heading into a situation where my own son might compare me with others. Maybe it was foolish, but I kept thinking of how Randy was going to take it when he saw what small potatoes his dad was against all the big shots. The miles passed slowly. I must have dozed off a while, woke suddenly. We were pulling into the Cloverdale station. I saw Randy waiting there to meet me. One look at the kid's face and I knew I was right. He was worried. Hello, Randy. Hi, Dad. How are things, kid? You're looking great. Gosh, I'm glad you could come, Dad. Is Mom all right? Mom? Why, sure. Mom's swell. Everything okay with you? Yes, sir. Everything's fine. Say, this is a pretty big day here at Cloverdale, huh? Yes, sir. It's about the most important day of the year, I guess. Having all the fathers and sons together. I'll bet. Say, I'd like a chance to freshen up a bit before I meet anybody. Yes, sir. We can go up to my room. It isn't far. I'll carry your bag. Oh, nothing doing. What are you trying to do, make an old man out of me? I'll carry my own bag. Come on, boy, let's go. Randy had never called me sir before. It was something they'd taught him here at Cloverdale. It gave me a proud feeling. We started across the campus toward Randy's quarters. Neither one of us said much. I could tell the youngster was uneasy as we walked past the cars parked all over the place. Big, shiny, expensive-looking jobs. We went up to Randy's room. I changed into my new suit. We started back across the campus, heading for the hall where the reception was being held. Well, how do you like my new suit, Randy? It's nice. Your mother helped me pick it out. She wouldn't let me get the plaid I wanted. Said the blue made me look more dignified. You didn't get mad, did you, Dad? Mad? Mad at what? At Mom, making you buy a blue suit. Well, I should say not. It'd take more than that to get me mad at Mom. She... she's pretty swell, isn't she, Dad? You bet she is. Kind of miss seeing her, don't you, Randy? Yes, sir, I do. Well, that's natural. After all, you... Did Mom drive you to the station, Dad? Sure. Did she kiss you goodbye? <laughs> Why, of course. She gave me a kiss for you, too. But I guess maybe you're too old now to be kissed by your father, huh? Yes, sir. I guess so. Here we are at the reception, Dad. Say, there's quite a crowd here. <laughs> there's Bobby. Hey, Bobby. One of your friends? Yes, sir. Hi, Bobby. Hi, Randy. I've been waiting for you. Dad, this is Bobby Dale. He's my best friend. Hello, Bobby. Hello, Mr. Bronson. Randy's told me a lot about you and his mom. So you and Randy are pals, huh? Yes, sir. We've been pals ever since school started. Hey, there's my father over there. Dad! Dad, over here! Well, Bobby, find your friend, did you? Yes, sir. Dad, this is Randy. And this is his father, Mr. Bronson. Hello, Randy. Oh, nice meeting you, Bronson. Glad to meet you, sir. I, I, Mr. Oh, you're Winthrop Dale of International Steel. <laughs> Why, yes. Uh, Bronson, Bronson. You couldn't be Alex Bronson. Why, no, no, I'm Mark Bronson. <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought for a minute you might be Alex Bronson. Well, last week he put over one of the biggest no, deals... No, no, I'm Mark Bronson. What line are you in, Bronson? Line? Oh, me? Oh, oh, I'm in drugs. Drugs, eh? I understand there's a rising market coming. Where's your plant? Plant? 
<laughs> well, I... I it's... Dad doesn't have a plant, Mr. Dale. He runs a drugstore in Lakeville. That's where we live. And it's got a soda fountain, too. A real one. Oh, I see. Drugstore with a soda fountain. Well, uh, well... Pardon me, Dad. There's Mr. Elliot. He said he wanted to see you. Oh, yes, Elliot. Yes, of course. Uh, excuse me, Bronson. Come along, Bobby. I, I want to see what he has okay, to say. Okay, Dad. About see you later, Randy. <clears throat> Bye, Mr. Bronson. So long, Bye. Bobby. Bye. Gosh, he's swell, isn't he, Dad? Who? Bobby's father. Oh, yes, of course. A fine man. They live in a great big house and have a yacht, too. That must be fun. Yes, it must be. That other man over there is Mr. Elliot, the headmaster. I guess we should go over and meet him, Randy. Well, he seems busy now. We can meet him later. Come on, Dad. I want you to meet some more of my friends. We went from one group to another. I wondered why the kid didn't have sense enough to see what was happening. Why did he have to make matters worse? But there wasn't any getting out of it now. Nice meeting you, Bronson. You don't say. A drugstore, hmm? With a soda fountain, too. Excuse me, Mr. Bronson. I see Franklin Jones over there. I want to ask him about something. I once knew a chap who started out running a drugstore, made himself a nice living, worked his way up. To... Well, well, a drugstore with a soda fountain. Everything all right, Dad? Sure. Everything's fine. Let's just sit here a while. Okay. I guess you met about everyone now. Did you like Mr. Elliot? Oh, yeah, sure. Seemed to be in quite a hurry. I guess he has to meet everybody. I wonder what he meant by saying he has something important to see me about. You're not in trouble, are you, son? No, Dad. I'm doing all right, I guess. You keeping up in your classes? Sure, Dad. You saw my reports. I've been second in the class. Yes, you've done very well, Randy. Never been able to be first, though. Bobby beat me every time. Bobby Dale? Yeah, he's good. But your friends. He's my best friend. You know when you're up here, away from home, well, he's good at sports, too. You seem to do all right at sports. Your mother and I were delighted when you sent home that medal you won. Mom was happy about it? Very happy, Randy. I'm glad. Say, Dad, they're going to have sports events for the fathers later. What kind of sports events, Randy? Oh, races and games and things. Over at the athletic field. You don't have to enter if you don't want to, Dad. Why shouldn't I enter the sports events? Say, I used to be pretty good at that sort of thing. Okay, Dad, only... Only what? Well, I don't want you to feel that you have to get in them just because of me. Oh, you mean you're afraid your old man will embarrass you. Well, don't you worry, son. This is something I'm good at. Come on, let's get over there and get started. This was the chance I'd been waiting for. When it came to sports, I could do something that Randy would be proud of. After all, maybe I wasn't a big shot in business, but this was something different. There was a crowd gathered on the athletic field. Winthrop Dale was there, his shirt sleeves rolled up. He looked surprisingly fit, too. One of the committee men came over, and I signed up for two of the events. Then we walked over to where the fathers were lining up. All ready for the fathers' big race. Line up here, please. <laughs> and make sure you don't hurry too much. You're in this, Dad. Go ahead, show him. You bet I will, son. Just watch my smoke. Right over here, gentlemen. Mr. Dale, Mr. Franklin, Mr. Bronson, Mr. Diskin, Mr. Oliver. Hello there, Bronson. So, we're going to do some running. Well, take it easy, because I'm going to win this one. I'll do my bragging when the race is over, Mr. Dale. <laughs> good idea, Bronson. That's a good idea. Ready, gentlemen? Yes. On your mark. Get set. And... I should have known better. I hadn't tried anything like this for ten years. I was winded after the first twenty yards. I could hear my heart pounding and felt weak as I watched the others reach the finish line. Winthrop Dale won the race. I came in last. Then came the broad jump. It was even worse than I had expected. I was disqualified in the first round. I could hear the kids laughing among themselves. And I saw the older men grinning. Randy's face wore a stony look. I knew he felt pretty low. I went over to him and we walked back across the campus toward the gymnasium. Sorry, Dad. You feeling all right? Sure, son. I, I'm fine. I guess a man gets a little soft after years of inactivity. Yeah, but you're a good sport, Dad. 
Maybe during next summer, I'll take time to practice up. You and I together, Randy. And then next year, we'll show them. I guess I gave a pretty terrible performance. I thought I'd do better. It doesn't matter, Dad. Honest, it's all in fun. <laughs> I could tell that Randy was doing his best to sound like a good sport. I thought, if there were just one thing I could do, just one thing that would justify best faith in me and make Randy proud of his old man. But I knew now that there wasn't. We got ready for the banquet that was scheduled for seven o'clock. We were on our way down to wait in the recreation room when I saw Headmaster Elliot coming in our direction. Hello there, Mr. Bronson. I've been looking for you. How are you enjoying things? Fine, fine, thank you. And you, Randy? Very good, sir. Randy, will you run over to my office and get my briefcase from Mr. Williams? Yes, sir. There's uh, a little matter, Mr. Bronson, something uh, I wanted to discuss with you. We can go in here. Yes, sir. Have a chair, please. Now, uh, I don't want you to misunderstand me, Mr. Bronson. We pride ourselves in our school spirit here at Cloverdale on the way we uh, make the boys feel at home. Yes, but, of course, sometimes it happens that a boy just doesn't fit into things, no matter you how... You mean that Randy doesn't fit into things at Cloverdale? Hasn't he spoken to you about it? No. He told me he was doing well. Oh, he's doing well in his grades. But there are other things of equal importance with classwork. You see, Randy is different from most boys here at Cloverdale. Different? In what way? Well... He, he comes from a home where he was very close to his parents. You see... Yes, it... yes. I see, Mr. Elliot. I see very clearly. You mean his father is different from the fathers of the other boys around here. You mean no one can point to me and say, there's Randy's dad, he made a million in steel, or... Oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute, Mr. Bronson. I said nothing of the kind. I wanted to say that Randy is a sensitive, introspective boy... A boy who worries about things far beyond his years. He has nothing to worry about here except his background. Maybe Randy hasn't any background because his father runs a drugstore. Maybe the boy isn't any credit to Cloverdale. Is that what you mean? Mr. Bronson, please. You're misinterpreting my intentions entirely. Exactly what are your intentions, Mr. Elliot? Merely to explain that Randy is not uh, completely happy here at Cloverdale. He's worried. Well, about you and Mrs. Bronson, his mother. About... What do you mean? Please, Mr. Bronson, I thought a suggestion would be sufficient. I may as well tell you, sir, the suggestion is insulting. Well, I, I'm sorry. I had hoped we could have a quiet talk and come to a better understanding. I've only the interest of Randy in mind. I want to help him. He's been very lonely and worried. I thought you might have some suggestion. Yes, I have a suggestion. Randy won't be returning here. I... Randy won't be coming back. Come in. Oh, that's all right, Randy. Come on in. I'd just as soon not discuss this anymore now, if you please. That's perfectly all right. Any decision you make in the matter is your privilege, Mr. Bronson. But all please, the same, I, I... Please, All right. You got the briefcase, Randy? Yes, sir. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Bronson. Is there something wrong, Dad? What? You look pale. Are you feeling all right? Oh, yeah, sure. I think we'll go out in the fresh air, son. I want to... Straighten out something in my mind. We walked around the campus a few times. I made three or four attempts to talk to Randy, but I was too upset. I finally decided to wait until after the banquet. Things were underway when we got to the hall. Bobby Dale had saved a couple of seats for us beside himself and his father. I didn't eat much. I sat there, feeling miserable and wishing it would end, we could get back home. Then Headmaster Elliot began calling on some of the fathers for impromptu speeches. I knew we were nearing the end of the affair when Winthrop Dale's name was called. He spoke briefly and significantly. In conclusion, I want to give you, young man, a piece of advice. It's a secret for success. Make yourself important and necessary in whatever job you have. Have confidence in yourself. That's the secret if you want others to have confidence in you. Thank you. Mr. Dale made a good speech, didn't he, Dad? He certainly did, son. Your friend Bobby has every reason to be proud of his father. And now, I'm going to ask Mr. Mark Bronson to favor us with a few words. 
I could see the upturned faces of the fathers and their sons watching me as I stood up. Cold beads of perspiration broke out on my forehead. I felt I was stumbling through what I wanted to say. I didn't have any secret of success to give them. I couldn't tell Hell Headmaster Elliot or the others how I felt about them. But I wanted to say something, something about friendship and a man's greatness as measured by his being true to himself, to his ideals, to his friends, to his loved ones and his home. I was afraid I had put it badly and sat down with a feeling of uneasiness. Gosh, Dad, that was swell. Bronson, that's one of the finest things I've ever heard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bronson. Thank you for an inspiring talk. Something from which I'm sure every father and son will find it. Randy and I walked back across the campus for the last time. Moonlight streaming down through the trees made a moving pattern on the ground. All around us we could hear the sound of voices, boys and dads saying goodbye, saying that they'd meet again after the holiday. We came to a bench beneath some maple trees and stopped. Let's sit down a minute, Randy. Sure, Dad. I guess you must be tired. Yes. Yes, I am. I'm tired. I'm tired in a lot of ways, son. Dad? Yeah? There's something... Well, there's something I want to talk to you about. Okay, Randy. What's on your mind? Well, it... It's about Mom. Mom? Is she... Are you sure she's okay, Dad? Okay? Sure, son. I've already told you. Mom's fine. What I mean is... Is everything okay between you and Mom? Between Mom and me? Why, of course. Why shouldn't it be? What are you getting at, son? Well, Bobby... Bobby hasn't got any mother. Oh, that's too bad. He's got one. But his mother and father are separated. Separated? You and Bobby have been talking about that? Yes, sir. You know, sometimes when you're away from home... You know, you get to talking about home and things. Yeah, I understand, son. Bobby's folks don't live together, and he doesn't have any Christmases or Thanksgivings at home like I do. Mm, I see. He comes here to school and spends a couple of weeks with his mother, a couple of weeks with his father, and then he's sent off to a summer camp somewhere. That's tough, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I got to thinking about you and Mom, and began to think that's maybe why you sent me to Cloverdale. But I guess I don't. I mean, I guess everything's all right between you and Mom, isn't it, Dad? Then... Why, that's why you've been acting so kind of worried, huh, son? I guess so, Dad. I didn't mean to. Maybe I kind of spoiled your fun. But the way Bobby figured, I was so lucky. And I felt sorry for him. Then I thought the same thing would happen to me. Sure, son, I understand. But you don't have to worry about Mom and me. You know, Dad, when a guy has folks who love each other, and Christmases and Thanksgivings and summer holidays, well, Bobby's my best friend. And I was wondering if you and Mom cared if he came down to Lakeville to see us for Thanksgiving. Son, that'll be great. Gosh, thanks, Dad. I closed my eyes again. There was a lump in my throat. And inside there was a, a warm, good feeling. Little things began to come back. I could understand now what Mr. Elliot meant. Yes, and Dale's enthusiasm for what I had said at the banquet. Suddenly I wished I'd talked to Dale more. Maybe, maybe I could have helped him. I, I hope I'm not disturbing this little conference. Oh, Mr. Elliot, I know, not at all. Good evening, sir. I saw you sitting down here. Yes, and I Randy and I have had a long talk. You know, Mr. Elliot, well, it's just like you said. There wasn't anything to worry about. I'm glad to hear that, Randy. I guess it was kind of a misunderstanding, Mr. Elliot. My apologies, sir. You know, youngsters sometimes get to worrying about things that never happen. Yes, boys are always very interesting. You can never tell what they'll think up next. <laughs> or for that matter, what they'll do next. I can understand that. Oh, that means Randy will be coming back. Maybe this time I think we should ask Randy how he feels about it. 
He's been pretty homesick and lonesome, of course, but, well, that happens with quite a few boys at first. Maybe it'll be different now. What do you say, Randy? Well, I like Cloverdale a whole lot. But gosh, Dad, you know. Yeah, I understand, son. Mr. Bronson, I don't know whether or not I can offer a little suggestion. Maybe it would be better if Randy stayed home for a year or two, but we want him back here at Cloverdale. In fact, when he comes back, I'm going to try to arrange a scholarship for him. He's a fine boy, a fine student. Thank you, sir. That's very kind of you, Mr. Elliot. A wonderful suggestion. I think even your mother will agree to that, Randy. She's kind of missed you, too. Dad, you think we could call Mom on the telephone? Call Mom? Why, we'll be home in a few hours, son. I know, but I'd just like to say hello and tell her. That's a good idea. In fact, I want to tell her something, too. I'd like to tell her she was right again. I wouldn't have missed this father and son day for anything. You have heard Ward Bond, Richard Lyon, and Dan O'Herlihy in Son of Mine. Now, here is tonight's family theater host, Eddie Cantor. You know, the most wonderful thing in the world is a happy family. But, of course, you can't have a happy family if you're not happy and cheerful yourself. That's how I worked out my own little secret for a happy home. I had a lot of help, though. Not only the help of a wonderful wife and our wonderful girls, but God's help. You can't help having a happy home with God's help. You can't miss by getting together as a family to ask His help. There's everything to gain by the daily practice of family prayer in your home. Because a family that prays together stays together. This is Eddie Cantor saying good night, folks, and God bless you. We'd like to thank Ward Bond, Richard Lyon, and Dan O'Herlihy for their performances this evening. Our thanks to Richard Wilkinson for writing tonight's play, and to Max Tare for his music. This production of Family Theater Incorporated was directed by David Young. Others who appeared in tonight's play were Edwin Cooper, Gail Bonney, Gilbert Barnett, Ross Forrester, Ralph Moody, and James Griffith. Next week, our family theater stars will be Joan Leslie and Paul Henry in Home for Thanksgiving. Your host will be Charles Boyer. This series of the Family Theatre broadcast is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program, by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need, and by a friend of the New York Foundling Hospital which cares for homeless and motherless babies without distinction of race, creed, or color. Portions of tonight's program were transcribed. Be with us next week at the same time when our Family Theatre stars will be Joan Leslie and Paul Henry with Charles Boyer as host. Tony Lofrano speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.